Hi AP Chemistry students, it's Mrs. Johnson. I want to start in this video by wrapping up chapter 8. Uh, the only topic left in chapter 8 for us to discuss is calculating delta H using bond enthalpies. And that's something that we've already done, it's just been a little while. So I want to briefly review it, work a problem with you, and then send you off on your way with chapter 8 or be done with it. So question 69 and 71 are the homework problems. I am going to work example number 70, okay, and this stuff again, I'm not going to touch on it in class again, but it will absolutely be on the unit 3 test, so it's imperative that you do these practice problems on your own. I think the key to getting these right is just organizing your work nice and neatly. So here's how I organize it. Example number 70 um, says, here's a reaction, what's the delta H of the reaction, uh, calculate it using bond enthalpies, okay, and you are given a table of bond enthalpies in your book. It is on page 374. I think it's table 8.4. So the first thing that I like to do is write the chemical reaction. The second step is going to be to draw the reaction in Lewis structures. And I like to do it right underneath the products and reactants that I've written here. So here are the Lewis structures. And please take note that where we have 3H2, I've drawn three different H2 molecules. Okay. Again, keeping the work nice and neat and organized, immediately underneath that, I like to set up a math equation. Okay, so we know that we can look up in the table the bond enthalpies for all of these different species. And that's exactly what I've done right here. So for the carbon-hydrogen bond, according to your textbook, the bond enthalpy is 413 kilojoules per mole. And I've gone right down the list. This is the enthalpy for one oxygen-hydrogen bond, one triple carbon-oxygen bond and then one HH bond, right? The thing to note here is that we need to do some multiplication. In this case, for this reaction, let's think first of all, how many carbon-hydrogen bonds am I talking about? It should be four. Here, I'm looking at two oxygen-hydrogen bonds. In this case, it's just one carbon-oxygen bond. And then finally, three hydrogen-hydrogen bonds, right? So the last thing that I need to do is just set up my signs. So remember, on this side of the chemical reaction, the reactants, bonds are broken. So the energies are going to have a positive value. So I would just assign a positive value here, a positive value here. The product side, these are formed, so they're going to release energy. Right? This is going to have a negative value, and this is going to have a negative value as well. The arrow the reaction arrow, I just like to replace with a plus sign. Okay. And there's our math equation. Super, super simple. You just sum up the value of the broken bonds and the formed bonds, make sure they have the right signs. Our total should be delta H equals negative 218 kilojoules per mole. Again, try those other examples on your own and make sure you're getting them correct. It will be on the Unit 3 test and you can always ask me if you're not understanding. Um, so, moving on to Chapter 9. And this is on the website. You can print this out or you can pick up a copy outside of my classroom door if you need to. Chapter 9, there's only two homework problems associated with it. It's 29A through E and number 39. So you should work those out after we meet in class. Or you can probably work them out after you finish watching this video if you want to get a little bit of head ahead. All right, so chapter 9 is all about hybridized orbitals. There's a lot that we're skipping, so I'm just hitting these pages that are listed up here. So remember back to chapter 8, in general, we're assuming that bonding involves valence electrons. And thus, we're talking about the valence orbitals. So let's look at methane here. This is CH4. Right. Carbon is the central atom, and we assume that carbon's four valence electrons are what's involved in bonding to the four hydrogens. The valence orbitals then for carbon, and we're assuming that this is probably where the bonds are taking place, those are going to be the 2s orbital, the 2px, the 2py, and the 2pz orbitals. These are the four valence orbitals that carbon would have. Right, so we'd assume that that's where the bonding electrons are thing, but there are two big problems with these assumptions. Okay, the 2s orbitals are, they have a different energy value than the 2p orbitals. And you should be thinking in your head, the 2s orbitals are actually lower in energy because they penetrate closer to the nucleus. That means the electrons there are going to be a little bit more tightly held. And we can see that in our bond energy diagram here. That This is like an off-bow diagram. Uh, excuse me, not bond energy, an off diagram. The 2s orbital is a little bit lower. So 
knowing that the 2s orbital is lower in energy than the 2p orbitals, that would mean that the, the CH bonds would have different bond enthalpies or values for energy. And that's just not the case. That's not what scientists see. Uh, the bonds are known to be identical. And then there's one more problem with this assumption that carbon's using the one, the 2s the, and the, the three different 2p orbitals. The geometry of methane, which you and I would predict to be tetrahedral, and the reason we predict that is because that there's, there's data to go along with that. Um, however, that doesn't line up with the geometry of the s and the p orbitals. So if we look at uh, this picture down here, here's the s orbital. It's around in shape. The p orbitals, each of the three p orbitals is double lobed around the x, y, or z axis. So this would be the shape of one of the p orbitals. You might think of an electron as probably being here and here or here and here. These are the two places where the electrons could be housed, right? That shape doesn't line up with tetrahedral being the same on all four sides. But we know based on data that the molecule is in a tetrahedral shape. So the scientists kind of had two options. They could either say, well, all of it's wrong, or they could amend the theory a little bit or kind of add to it. And that's what they've done. So scientists came up with the idea that when forming molecules, carbon and all atoms actually form new orbitals of equal energy. These are called hybridized orbitals. Hybridized. And that's supposed to be a B in there. I just kind of messed it up. So this new explanation explains away the tetrahedral shape, the energies, while not really shifting our understanding of bonding that much. So when carbon forms methane, or any molecules form, not just carbon, that's just our example here, instead of using the 2s, the 2, and then the 2px, 2py, and 2pz orbitals, carbon blends all four of them together to create four orbitals that have equal energy. And that's what this diagram over here is showing. Rather than the off-bow diagram with the 2s orbital and then the three 2p orbitals that are slightly higher in energy, carbon hybridizes all four of the orbitals to be the same energy, some sort of intermediate values. These blended orbitals or hybridized orbitals, we call them sp3 orbitals. And the reason that we call them sp3 orbitals is pretty simple. It's because they came from an s orbital and three different p orbitals. Right? You'll also hear statements like this. In CH4, the carbon atom is sp3 hybridized. That's how you could use this terminology. Or it's undergone sp3 hybridization. Any of these would be uh, correct ways to, to talk about the blended orbitals that exist. Okay, And I'll show you some more things in class if we have time for it. But here are the take home points for orbital hybridization. If we're talking about sp3 hybridization, and it's for any molecule, not just uh, a molecule with carbon at the center, if Vesper's telling you that the electron geometry is tetrahedral, that means that there's four groups or things around the central atom, the central atom is going to be sp3 hybridized, right, from 1s and 3p orbitals, so sp3 hybridized. Another way to think about it, any time the atom is surrounded by four electron groups, we would assume that the atom is sp3 hybridized. Okay, so let's take a look here. What is the hybridization on the nitrogen atom in NH3? In order to do this, just like if you're working with Vesper, you need to draw the Lewis structure first, then think about the electron geometry, and you can take it a step further and think about hybridization. So here we go, the Lewis stru structure for NH3, if you don't have it memorized yet. It's N in the center, surrounded by three H's, and there's a lone pair on nitrogen, right? There are four electron groups we're not just looking at bonds here, remember. So there's four electron groups around the nitrogen. The hybridization on the nitrogen is going to be sp3. And then the hybridization on each carbon atom in ethane, that is going to be C2H6. So attempt drawing that Lewis structure on your own. If you want to pause the video, you may certainly do so. I'm going to keep writing up here. Ethane is going to look like this. All right. If we're looking at each carbon separately, there's one, two, three, four bonds or four electron groups around each carbon. So each of these carbons is going to be sp3 hybridized. And that's pretty much it. Okay. If we flip over to the back page, we don't have just sp3 hybridization. There's also sp2 and sp hydrogen hybridization. Excuse me. 
There's also hybridization involving d orbitals, but that's not part of this course. We're just going sp3, sp2, and sp. So you can probably guess if an atom is sp2 hybridized, what do you think that means or how many things are around it? If it me obviously means that the, the central atom has blended an s orbital and two of the p orbitals, so it must have three things surrounding it. So if Vesper tells you that the electron geometry is trigonal planar, the central atom is going to be an sp2 hybrid, or is going to have hybridized its s and two of the p orbitals. Okay, another way to think about it, any time an atom is surrounded by three electron groups, we assume it's going to be sp2 hybridized. Remember, we would count a double bond, like one electron group, for the purposes of this. So let's look at an example, boron in BH3, what's the hybridization? Right, so maybe pause the video and try drawing the Lewis structure, I'm going to do it here. This is what boron looks like in BH3. It doesn't have an additional lone pair uh, in, in its valence shell, so this is, this is what it looks like, right? There's three groups around boron, so we would say is sp2 hybridized. And then in ethene, chemical formula for ethene is C2H4. Let's take a look at each of the carbon atoms in ethene. What, what's the hybridization on each of those? Okay, so drawing out the ethene molecule, it would be something like this. Two carbons double bonded, and each of them is also attached to two hydrogens. So looking at each carbon, there's one, two, three things around it. We can imagine that each of these carbons would have a trigonal planar geometry. It's going to be each carbon sp2 hybridized. And then lastly is sp hybridization. So if Vesper is telling you that the electron geometry is linear, hopefully you were able to think about that, the central atom is going to be an sp hybrid. That means that the s orbital and one of the p orbitals has been hybridized to form orbitals of equal energy. And another way to think about it, any time an atom is surrounded by only two electron groups, we'd assume the atom is sp hybridized. So let's check out CO2, the carbon in CO2. Drawing the Lewis structure, and again, you always have to start with the Lewis structure. Then you'd think about electron geometry. There's two groups here. This is going to be a linear molecule. So the carbon has only two groups around it. It must be sp hybridized. And in ethene, C2H2, what's going to be the hybridization on each carbon atom? So here is ethene. And again, these are Lewis structures that you should be able to draw on your own. Maybe not as quickly as I'm drawing them in the video, but you should be able to get to, your, get to them pretty quickly. Right, I could look at this carbon and say, okay, each of these only has two things around it. Just looking at this side of the molecule, this carbon uh, it would be a linear shape here. And then on the other side, this car the, the right carbon being central, this would have a linear shape as well. So each of those carbons must be sp hybridized. And that's pretty much it. We will cover the rest of this stuff in class when I see you.